Good afternoon. My name is David Steib. I'm the president of Washington Council of Lawyers and the language access director at IUDA, a nonprofit that offers legal, social, and language access services to immigrants in the DC area. I'm excited to welcome you to today's conversation with Justice, Justice Elena Kagan and Dean William Trainer. On behalf of the council, I would like to start by thanking Georgetown University Law, Law Center, my alma mater, for hosting us today and making this event a success. Before I offer a brief introduction of our speakers today, I'd like to take a minute to talk about the Washington Council of Lawyers. We are a voluntary bar association committed to ensuring that our legal system treats everyone fairly, regardless of money, position, or power. Our current strategic plan focuses on training, developing leaders, advocacy, and building community. Being a member of Washington Council of Lawyers loops you into great events like this one and makes you part of a community of lawyers from all sectors gathered together around the common cause of ensuring access to justice. We are passionate about supporting the next generation of lawyers, and many of our programs, like our summer forum, are geared towards law students. If you're not already a member, we encourage you to join. You can sign up online, or you could uh, join on your way out uh, after the program. A few housekeeping notes. For today's event, you can follow us on Twitter, at Wash Lawyers. We're using the hashtag, hashtag Kagan19. Please note that photographs are permitted only during the first two minutes of the conversation. We ask that you silence your cell phones and that you refrain from using them during the program unless you're following along on Twitter. <laughs> and finally, there will be a reception immediately following the event at the top of the stairs. Today, I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, United States Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, who has dedicated her career to legal education, public service, and the protection of fundamental values common to all Americans. Justice Kagan received her Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University, her Master of Philosophy from the University of Oxford, and her Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. After law school, Justice Kagan clerked for Judge Abner Mikva of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and later, during the 1987 term, for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the U.S. Supreme Court. After briefly practicing law at a Washington, D.C. law firm, she became a law professor, first at the University of Chicago Law School and later at Harvard Law School. Justice Kagan also served for four years for the in the Clinton administration as associate counsel to the president and then as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. Starting in 2003, she served for six years as the dean of Harvard Law School. In 2009, President Obama nominated her as the Solicitor General of the United States, and she became the first female to hold that role. A year later, pres the President nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and she took her seat in August of 2010. Today's conversation with Justice Kagan will be moderated by the Dean and Executive Vice President of Georgetown University Law Center, William M. Trainer. Dean Trainer received his Bachelor of Arts from Yale University, a Doctor of Philosophy and History from Harvard University, and his Juris Doctor from Yale Law School. Dean Trainer clerked for the Honorable James L. Oakes, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, before serving in a variety of positions in state and federal government. In 1991, Dean Trainer began teaching at Fordham Law School, where he would later serve for eight years as dean. Dean Trainer joined Georgetown University Law Center in 2010 and has led the school through impressive changes, including a great expansion in the number of experiential offerings across the clinical, externship, practicum, and simulation programs. Given Dean Trainer's longtime support of public interest advocacy by students and lawyers, Washington Council of Lawyers is appreciative for his service as a member of our honorary board. And now I will turn the stage over to Dean Trainer and Justice Kagan to start our program. Very good. Welcome, Justice Kagan. We're well, thank really you, delighted Dean to have you here. Um, it's great to be here. I should say that first. I mean, so thank you to all the members of the Washington Council of Lawyers for 
all the great work that they do, promoting pro bono and public interest and public service. It's uh, an enormously important role in the, in the legal profession. So I thank you for everything you do, and I'm glad to be here. Good. Well, we're so, just so delighted that you're here and so delighted that we're co-sponsoring with the Washington Council. And David, we're very proud of you and all you've achieved. <laughs> um, so one thing actually that I just wanted to add, uh, David, that was a terrific introduction of Justice Kagan. One thing that as a former New Yorker that I wanted to highlight is that you graduated from Hutter High School. So uh, anybody in your, I mean, Princeton, Oxford, Harvard, Dean of Harvard Law School, Solicitor, Supreme Court, is all fine. Um, but it's really, really hard to get into Hutter High School. <laughs> so I think everything else was predictable from that moment. So. But uh, you know, it's actually easier back then. <laughs> yeah, I probably I, wouldn't get in so now. That's so disillusioning. <laughs> Back then, there was a very, very odd uh, school. It was, uh, it was public high school, and it's, a, it's one of these test high schools, which is what you're referring mm -hmm. to when you say it's, it's hard to, uh, to get in. But it was also all girls hmm. s until several years after I arrived there. Uh, uh, when I was in ninth grade, they started taking boys in the seventh grade, which was hmm. not really in keeping with what all the ninth graders thought should happen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, so there were only half as many applicants, you know? <laughs> well, clearly the admissions people knew what they were doing. So, <laughs> so again, it's really, it's delightful to have you here. Um, but I, what I wanted to actually, uh, you know, I think as we start this, um, you know, everybody very much front of mind is Justice Stevens is passing. Uh, you know, and, and I know this is a, uh, a week of mourning at the court. Um, and you hold Justice Stevens' seat. And um, Justice Stevens is quoted as having said, uh, when he spoke in 2015 at the University of Miami, uh, thanks to Elena, I have never regretted my decision to retire. That's lovely. Um, so, you know, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about Justice yeah. Stevens. I mean, it is a week of, of, of mourning, but you know, if, if, if it's ever appropriate to say something like it's also a celebration of a life, I think it will be that too, because my gosh, what a life. Mm -hmm. uh, 99 years old, uh, sh sharp as a tack until the day he died, um, went very peacefully. And um, uh, so we, sh we should all have a life like that. Um, he was an extraordinary man, an extraordinary justice. Um, to, to take the extraordinary man part of it first, uh, I, I don't think that there's a person who's ever met him. I don't, you know, every clerk I've ever spoken to, all his colleagues, uh, lawyers who appeared before the court. I mean, everybody uses the same words to describe him, which is kind and humble and uh, uh, respectful of everybody, treated everybody with extraordinary dignity, had just so much personal class and so much kindness. And uh, you know, every clerk he had, I think, would tell you he's the best boss that they ever had. Um, and then uh, a, a, a truly extraordinary justice. Of course, he served uh, a very long time on the court, um, 35 years. And uh, you know, uh, um, retired when he was 90 years old, and, and, and again, still like just totally actively contributing to leading a particular wing of the court at that time. Um, and uh, so he was um, you know, a, a brilliant lawyer in the kind of technical and craft aspect of the job, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and at the same time, he had a real passion for justice, a real, uh, uh, you know, an insistence that the legal system operate fairly for uh, those going through it. And, and I think the marriage of those two things, the sort of brilliant lawyerly capacity and this insistence that uh, our legal institutions be fair uh, is, is, is what uh, really marked him as a justice. He was fiercely independent. Um, and in, in different parts of 
uh, his career, which stretched over a lot of years. He played different roles on the court, some being more the kind of uh, solo mm -hmm. concurrence and some being more the leader of a particular set of justices. But throughout, I think, he was marked by this really uh, strong sense of, uh, uh, I'm going to do what I think is right, uh, kind of uh, integrity in his own decision making and a kind of independence in his own decision making. But at the same time, he uh, was, you know, the model of collegiality and, and I think he really cared about the court as an institution. So that uh, at one and the same time, he was like, I, I have to do what I think is right, but, but I also understand that the court has to operate as an institution and I'm a part of it. And uh, I think he married those things in a, in a pretty unique way. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, he produced this uh, just incredibly important body of work, mm -hmm. majorities and dissents. Mm -hmm. You know, in 35 years, you can write a lot of both. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a body of work that I think, uh, you know, is, is, is not surpassed, certainly, in uh, modern times. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, I recently went back and looked at his nomination and, and the press accounts. And one of the big concerns at the time was his health. Um, well, they didn't have to worry. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> he just had a heart attack. I mean, attack. I think what's, what's so striking, it's like, you know, actually, I think he seemed to all of us eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there he was. He's... 95 years old, he's swimming in the ocean every day, you know? <laughs> um, no, and it's really, it's amazing because like the, you know, the other, I think the other longest term or the oldest justice was Holmes. And Justice Holmes, I think his opinions really declined towards the uh -huh. end in terms of their quality. Whereas Justice Stevens' yeah. opinions were really Absolutely remarkable not. throughout. Yeah. Um, so what would you think his, his greatest legacy? Is there an area that he shaped, or is it a, a philosophy that, he, that others have followed? Uh, gosh, I, you know, I think that there was, it, was, it stretched across such a wide range of subject matter areas. I, I guess I would have a hard time picking just one. Am I missing something obvious? No, I don't, no, I, no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think one thing that I, that's kind of the standard story about Justice Stevens is in some sense his role on the court changed over time. Uh, that when he started in the court, he was really, uh, you know, a loner, you know, uh, kind of writing his own opinions. Right, I and mean, when I clerked at the court, so that was in the 87 term, mm -hmm. and that's still what he was doing. He, was, he would write a lot of solo dissents, solo concurrences, uh, some of which you thought, man, he's got it, you know? Uh, you know, notwithstanding that maybe the case wasn't argued that way and that wasn't what, like, all the other justices were thinking about or what they weren't thinking in that frame, but you would sometimes read it and you would say, it's really too bad that they're not because that's really the way to look at this case, mm -hmm. even though everybody else is kind of over here doing something else. Now, occasionally you would say, well, it seems a little quirky, um, but, but there was always, you know, this kind of, this is the way I... Um, look at the case. And that did, I mean, I think he, you, you know, it was, I think that uh, he was always somewhat like that. Like, you know, I'm just, that my job is to tell you how I see a case, regardless whether everybody else sees it the same way. Um, uh, but he did become, in his later years, and really in his last, I don't know, how long was it, 10 or 15? Mm -hmm. Uh, year, so um, his last, you know, 25% of his, his tenure, he became sort of the senior justice, often in dissent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that meant he wrote a lot of those dissents or assigned them, but wrote a lot of them. And, uh, you know, it meant, you know, some of the positions that he staked out in those last years uh, really were ones where it's like, no, the court's gotten this wrong, but, you know, Here's the way you should think about it for the future. That's, um, so let me just talk a little bit about kind of two things that, uh, that I reflect on with Justice Stevens. Uh, one is you know, the role of dissents, um, which I'd like to talk about. The other, before we get to that, 
so you know, the, kind of the normal arc for Justice Stevens is you know people talk about him as kind of very individualistic, brilliant, uh, but you know writing his own opinions at the start, and then in the last decade becoming the leader of the liberal wing of the court. Um, the other is that he's somebody who was both changed his mind and accept you know was was candid about that. Uh, that he. Uh, with affirmative action or the death penalty or the takings clause, he, you know, he shifted his position over time. Uh, now, and you know, which brings up the question of stare decisis and how much you follow it. Um, but before you go on, mm -hmm. I mean, I just wanted to respond to, to, to that part of it. So I, uh, I did, I was uh, Justice Stevens' successor and he was endlessly kind to me in terms of offering advice, but in, always in a very kind of graceful way, like not imposing advice, but really um, being there if I ever had a question and offering whatever wisdom, uh, you know, he, he could. But one of, the, one of the things that he said that really s stuck with me um, and, and this was, again, you, you know, hearing this from a man who had just served 35 years on the court, was he said he tried to think every term about, like, all the things he could learn the hmm. next term. Hmm. And, you, you, you know, most hmm. people, they've been doing a job 35 years, they kind of think they got it down, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Or at least that the time for apprenticeship and the time for learning is over. Mm -hmm. And I do think that he was not like that, and it was one of the... Um, uh, one real aspect of his greatness, which was that he was constantly thinking and rethinking and thinking about what he didn't know yet and thinking about what opportunities there were for continued learning. And, you know, it's a great lesson for everybody in, in, on, in all aspects of life. But, uh, but I think it's especially so maybe for judges because Everybody treats you as though you're a very specially important person, and you know everybody tells you that everything you do is just you know you know there are all, not um, all that many people who come up to you and tell you what you've gotten wrong, and <laughs> and it's it's easy to kind of convince yourself that you have reached a point where you know everything. Mm -hmm. I think, and he was the absolute antithesis of that. It's interesting. So um, when I was at Fordham as the dean, uh, Abner Green, uh, who you know very well, uh, put together a symposium of his, Justice Stevens' former clerks in academia uh, to mark Justice Stevens' 30th year on the bench. And the talk that he gave, the justice gave, was called Learning on the Job. Gosh. So, and you know what- I he, didn't know that, but it fits that, with, no, yeah. No, that's exactly. And so what he did was he talked about uh, actually the focus was really substantive due process and that he had a certain take on it that it was an oxymoron uh, when he became a justice and how he changed his mind over time and that that's what justices should do. They should learn on the job. Uh, so it really resonates with mm -hmm. what you, your experience with him. Um, and with your original question, which mm -hmm. was about changing your mind. Mm -hmm. So do you change your mind? Uh, well, I haven't been there 35 years yet, so I've had, <laughs> and I wouldn't tell you right now, actually. <laughs> you know, there were these opinions I wrote in my first two or three years that really, they were just wrong. <laughs> I don't think I'd tell you, I don't think I'd tell the, the world of litigants out there right now. <laughs> But, uh, but I do think uh, often about, about, uh, about that piece of advice mm -hmm. and about uh, trying to make sure that you keep an open mind and that you don't, and that you don't think that you've settled everything. And then, and so, and then moving from that to stare decisis, the court's changing its mind. Yeah. Uh, so in the Nick case recently, you, know, you wrote very powerfully about the importance of stare decisis. And I think Actually, I was talking to Irv Gornstein and Marty Lederman before we spoke, and I think in the last two terms there have been six cases in which, or roughly six, in which uh, parties have sought to have a precedent overturned. Hmm. Uh, and it ha four cases the court has overturned. Six precedent. where the question presented is overturn this case. Right. Uh -huh. And four in which the court overturned precedent. Huh. 
uh, and in all six, I was you, not on that you were side. not on the overturned precedent. Yeah. Uh, and then in the Nick case, uh, most recently at the end of the term in the takings area, uh, you talked about the importance of stare decisis. Yeah, I mean, I've done this before. Because, I mean, but one of the cases, I'm not sure if it was on your list of six, maybe it was a few years earlier, uh, was a case in which I end up writing a majority opinion. It was not a, you know, a particularly hot button kind of case. It was a patent doctrine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which uh, some people thought was a sort of silly patent doctrine that should never have come out the way it did, but had been around for 60 years, something like that. And, and the question was, and I, on that one, I wrote the majority. It was, um, it, was a majority I, it was a majority that Justice Scalia assigned to me. He was the uh, senior justice in the majority at that, at that time. And, and um, I'll, I'll give away not much of a secret, but he said to me, he said, I think you should take this case, Elena, because it will, it will require it will like force you to think about what you think this doctrine is really all about, mm -hmm. this doctrine of stare decisis. Mm -hmm. So it was a great opportunity that he gave me to sort of think about and write about uh, why we had this doctrine and what it was for and when we should use it and when we, when we should depart from it. And of course, sometimes you do depart from it. So it's not, we always say it's not an inexorable rule. And uh, even though I'm 0 for 6 apparently in the last two years, <laughs> and I think if you go back Further than that, you'll find that my track record is not all that much different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's not like I'm going to commit never to overturning mm -hmm. a case because sometimes there are uh, real reasons for it. But, but I, I, I do believe that, uh, that the heavy presumption is that we shouldn't and that there have to be um, reasons beyond just ordinary wrongness. Um, and the court has a whole list of factors that it thinks about when it thinks about what kinds of things justify overruling a case. Uh, maybe, you know, one of them could be called like super wrongness, you know, wrongness where the, where the case just, you know, just is, um, is no longer in line with anything that the society thinks about how a legal system should operate or indeed how other uh, institutions should operate. But more often, it's uh, things like, well, the, you know, the, the particular case has become a real outlier, um, that, the, that, the, that the, uh, the legal rules and doctrines have changed all around it, uh, leaving it a kind of uh, just weirdness in the law. Sometimes it's that non-legal things change so that the um, so that the precedent operates in ways that nobody would have expected and that nobody really thought about. Mm -hmm. So you have to have sort of some something beyond just oh it was wrong. Mm -hmm. That that is it's more like no it's just you know what we've we've learned something uh, since then about uh, about uh, that makes it incongruous or that makes it utterly unadministrable. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, as I say, sometimes that makes it, it just makes it like just morally repugnant. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but that for me is a, is a pretty high bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in these many cases, uh, I think it, it they're not met. Uh, the, the court has uh, thought about it in in recent years. And so why should it be a high bar? Um, uh, you know, for a few reasons, I think. Uh, um, people rely on stable legal rules, on predictable legal rules. Uh, and even when people don't structure their decision making uh, to accord with those rules, I think in a broader sense, society relies on the idea that law is stable and that law is predictable and that law won't change just because particular members of the court uh, are different mm -hmm. or change. So I think the, the, maybe the worst thing people could think about our legal system is that, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, one person uh, retires or dies and another person gets on the court and everything is up for grabs because it's all just like what that particular person, uh, you know, what, um, 
his or her preferences and predilections are. And uh, so you can never count on anything and you can never understand law as a stable, continuing presence in people's lives and in society's lives, uh, in society's life. I think also uh, the doctrine of precedent, it's one of humility, right? Which, uh, so this is Justice Stevens all over. I mean, one of Justice Stevens' personal characteristics, which, I, which everybody so admired, is this humility and this modesty. And that means not thinking that, oh, here I am, and I just look at this case differently from the way many, many judges have looked at it in the past, and my opinion is better than theirs, and so I'm just going to uh, reverse what they say. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a sense of, you know what, before you, uh, we, had a, we had a case this year where people asked us to overrule something that something like 40 different justices had looked at and said this is the way the rule should be. Now, to, you know, there's something uh, maybe a little bit immodest about saying notwithstanding that 40 people have done it this way, I just have a better idea of how to do it. So again, it's not that you should never be able to do that. Sometimes, of course you should. But, uh, but it should be a high bar. So I mean, and so part of it is, if I'm just paraphrasing what I think I'm hearing, uh, that it's part of the rule of law, and it's part of a court being you know, understood as apolitical. You know, that it's not That was said much more succinctly than I did. <laughs> so so, um, so when do you dissent? So, so again, so Nick, um, I have to say, somebody writes on the takings clause. I was just delighted that people were paying attention to a takings clause case. Um, and you wrote a terrific dissent. Uh, and so part of it was really just incredibly rigorous analysis of you know, a very difficult doctrine. And then part of it was a discussion of stare decisis and its, its significance. Um, and you, you know, during the course of your decade on the court, you've written a kind of a series of really extraordinarily powerful dissents. Uh, what's your, first of all, what's your audience when you write? Thank you. <laughs> a round of applause for the dissents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what's, when you write a dissent, what's your audience? Who are you writing for? Uh, it varies. Mm -hmm. Because you write lots of different kinds of dissents, right? Sometimes you just, you write a dissent because you think that the court has gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. And the parties deserve to know that the case is not really a 9-0 case, that it's a lot closer than that. In fact, there are people who were persuaded by the other side. And, uh, and you know, this is the way you saw the case differently. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's uh, you know, it, was, it might not be the most important case in the world, but it's important enough mm -hmm. uh, to say, Look, I saw the case differently. Here's why I saw the case differently. But at the same time, you know that once you say that, it's over. It's done with. Uh, you know, you're not going to be pounding the table the next case that comes along and saying, oh, you know, I'm sticking with my dissent. You know, I just refuse to accept the particular majority opinion. Um, I mean, you, you know, you had a different view. You've said the view, but now it's like uh, you're back on the team again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of dissents are just like that, right? Uh, where you're, it's, it's, it's not the first in a continuing line of dissents, um, or it's not you know, the, uh, you know, a battle that you keep on repeating over and over. It's just, yeah, I saw the case differently. Here's the way I saw it. OK. Mm -hmm. um, but then other uh, cases are different. Uh, I'm not going to say which one Nick falls into. You know, I wrote a dissent which is obviously very different this year. I, um, uh, I wrote a dissent in the gerrymandering mm -hmm, case, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I, I didn't really pull my punches about the importance that I thought that that decision had to our political system and and to the way we govern ourselves. And um, you know, there's no part of me that's ever going to become. Um, accepting or uh, of of uh, of of uh, the decision made, essentially if that you know that the courts shouldn't get involved in gerrymandering, no matter how bad it is, and no matter how destructive of our political system it, it is, which uh, which is the decision that the court reached, and 
And so there you really are, you know, you're not just, you're not writing The Descent because you just saw, you saw the thing differently and you think everybody should know that there were two sides to this mm -hmm. issue. You're writing a dissent because you want to convince the future, mm -hmm. and uh, you want. You, I guess you want to convince the present too. Um, but um, uh, you know, you know, for all those people out there who uh, who, in some way, can um, uh, can uh, carry on uh, the uh, you know efforts against this kind of undermining of democracy, you know, go for it because you're right. And, um, and for the future, you know, um, you know, maybe the court will change its mind on this one. Maybe things will happen that will convince it to change mm -hmm. its mind. Maybe the world will look different enough in however many years that this will be an appropriate opportunity. Now, maybe it won't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, you know, we, we can all look into crystal balls and maybe the majority will be right about the effects of this going forward. Um, you know, I don't think so. Um, and, and if I'm right, there will be an opportunity to say, well, what's happened in these intervening years and does that make a difference? Um, but there, look, you, you, know, you know, that one was, you know, there, there are dissents that's like, well, you know, I saw the case differently. Here's mm -hmm. the way I saw it. Now we start all over mm -hmm. again. And there are dissents that are, this is, uh, this is abysmally wrong. And, and, and um, uh, you know, it was not an, uh, in some, I mean, there were difficult issues in the case. Uh, you know, I, um, uh, the, the, you can understand why the majority reached the decision it did. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a hundred percent certain in every bone of my body that the majority was acting in complete good faith as to why it reached the decision it did. But, but I do think it got it wrong, and and that was one which was a kind of uh, you know I want uh, I want everybody to be thinking about this going forward. And there there was a very very powerful dissent. Um, so just in terms of kind of the writing of something like that, you know, I mean there were just so many kind of memorable points. Is that, w in a case like that, do you do like the, now I'm shifting from kind of the theory to the legal writing question. Um, you know, do you kind of outline the points that you want to make and then turn it over to your clerks? How does something like that get constructed? Uh, I guess I write all my opinions the same way, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're majorities or dissents and whether they're, um, more important or less important, I seem to be incapable of not uh, following just a, a single procedure. Um, the way I do it is I ask my clerks to give me a first draft. I use that first draft as um, mostly as a springboard for my own thoughts. Um, you know, I sort of see how one person um, wanted to do it, but then I open up a new document on my computer. I sort of put the new draft into a you know different screen, and I sometimes drag over quotes or citations or mm -hmm. things like that. But but um, but I start all over again, uh, and um, you know the draft is helpful for me because it helps me sort of get my own ideas in order. But but I find that the only way I can know that what I'm you know the, the only way that I can figure out a case whether I'm writing it from the majority or the dissent is, is really to write my way through it. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just write my way through it. And um, you know, in a dissent, you're obviously using as a foil the majority opinion. And the ma majorities are in some sense harder because you don't have that. Uh, uh, you know, dissents, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier just to sort of deconstruct something than when it's a majority, it's like you have the responsibility to sort of solve every problem. In a sense, you don't really have that responsibility. You just have to sort of say why they are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, hopefully in a good dissent, you give some sense of the alternative vision of the universe, but you don't have to quite fill in all the details as much as you do in a majority. Um, so there's something that's uh, a little bit easier and, and sort of a little bit more fun about a dissent because, except for the fact that you're really distressed that you lost. Uh, but it is kind of fun to sort of uh, take shots at, uh, <laughs> at, at what you think is maybe not optimal reasoning. Um, 
uh, and uh, so anyway, I got, you know, then I got to the end, and then I used my clerks as editors. Hmm. And we do a few rounds, you know, I give it to one clerk, and then I give it to the other clerk, and then I give it to two other clerks. Um, so we do a, f a few rounds of editing, and then I release it to the world. Um, do you have a favorite dissent? Uh, I don't know, like, um, favorite in what way? Because <laughs> it is, it's like the one, you know, it's, you know, some of them, it's, I hated that dissent because, because I really hated so much to lose that case, mm -hmm. as opposed to some dissents where it's like, yeah, well, I lost, who cares, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, so, um, I mean, it's a, so on your writing style, for example, and with, you know, going back to the Nick case, um, one of the things that I, I think is distinctive about your voice uh, is that you both have you know, incredibly careful, rigorous analysis. So, so again, in Nick, you really respond very carefully. This is why I accept these invitations, is because, <laughs> you, know, like, you know what I said about people don't often tell you? I have rarely had a conversation where the person sitting in your chair said, you know, I just read that dissent you wrote, and I think you missed the following, <laughs> the following five important points. It wasn't very good. It was badly written. Nobody's ever done that ever done to that? me. No, never. Now, if they did that, would you accept a return invitation? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, so, but it's, it's a combination of both kind of the response, you know, very careful, but then also, you know, very powerful close that has kind of a almost a colloquial style. Um, and so, you know, it, it's striking to me. I, th I don't think there's anybody who's got a voice like yours on the court. Um, is there anybody when you became... I don't, you know, I, I mean, in some ways, you know, each of us has uh, his or her own distinctive voice. If mm -hmm. you gave me 10 opinions uh, and said, pick the author, I, 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 I suspect I'd be awfully good mm -hmm. at... And picking the author of all ten, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think we each have um, our own individual voice. But uh, I mean, what I try to do, uh, you know, uh, obviously I try to be as uh, analytically good as I can be. I think good lawyering is super important. I think you know, good rhetoric does not, um, uh, you know, you know, good rhetoric without good uh, analysis is is a. You know, doesn't make up for it. Mm -hmm. I, um, so, so you know, uh, first helps to be on the right side, uh, of, uh, and you know, I, I pay a lot of attention to what are the best legal arguments here. How can we, how how can we sharpen those arguments? How can, um, uh, you know, sort of all the lawyerly kind of things that uh, that I started by saying that Justice Stevens was such a wizard at. Um, so I try. Um, uh, but I do, um, I, I also want, I want people to understand it. I, so I, I spend a lot of time, try, you know, sometimes law is complicated and law can be arcane. And, uh, and some of these um, correct arguments can be hard to understand. And so you have to spend, have to spend just as much time trying to figure out how do you communicate um, uh, these these points to people so that they'll understand them, and not just lawyers, and not just sort of specialized lawyers, um, but ordinary people. I mean, for sure, in a case like that gerrymandering case, I, I don't want just lawyers to understand mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. I want high school students to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. And so how do you communicate these points in a way that will, people will understand, and in a way that people will, it will sort of stick with people. Um, so I get that. It's not just like, you know, I, I understand it. It's like I get why she thinks this is so important and it's going to stick with me. And, um, and the way I think about that, honestly, and I think you'll appreciate this, is um, I think about it in the way I used to think about how to teach a class. You know, you would come into your office before a class and you would say, it's really complicated material and I'm going to be uh, talking about it uh, to and with a bunch of people who are smart and who are engaged and want to understand what you're talking about, but who don't know much. And how are we going, how am I going to um, uh, 
convey this really complicated stuff to them. And I, I think about when, when I sit down and I write these opinions, whether they're majorities or dissents, I, 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 I try to ask myself just that question. The dissents can be much more personal. You know, I try to maintain a certain level of um, formality in my writing when I write for the court as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, uh, still less formal than some of my colleagues, but I, I don't like just let it all hang out. And you know, I, 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 try, I try not to do things that I think my colleagues wouldn't be comfortable with because it's their opinion as much as it is my opinion when you're writing mm -hmm. for the court. I, um, when you're writing as a dissent, you can be much freer mm -hmm. to, um, to, to uh, in, in, in your style and in uh, the points you make both. So that's another reason why, you know, except for the fact that you've just lost, uh, writing a dissent can often be a lot more fun than writing majority. Do you have, is there a former justice no longer on the court whose writing style you admire in particular, or is this all? You know, I mean, everybody has to have, um, their own, uh, uh, and uh, so it's not as though I tried to mimic any one person's. Um, you know, I think probably the thing that uh, more people on the court seem to agree on in terms of uh, Supreme Court history than anything else is that Justice Jackson was a great writer. Mm -hmm. Like if you ask everybody on the court who their favorite old justices were, you know, you know pretty much everybody puts Justice Jackson on their list. And um, somebody said to me recently that Justice Jackson served on the court for barely longer than I have by now. And it made me feel so deflated. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? He wrote all of that in just the time I've been on the court? So, I, I mean, he was an extraordinary writer. Um, Justice Scalia was an extraordinary writer, I think. There, you know, and, and again, I don't think I uh, write like him, just as I don't write like Justice Jackson. And there are things, um, you know, times when uh, I th thought that Justice Scalia went too far, just as there are times when other people think I go too far. Um, but uh, he, he was a, a writer who I constantly learned from. Um, uh, uh, who, who are your favorite writers? Right. Well, I mean, uh, Jackson, I think. Yeah, is, uh, it's just like, um, it's, it's not even it's interesting not, to say yeah, that, no, I think you know? That's right. <laughs> um, I mean, Holmes. I think uh -huh. Holmes was not a great yeah. justice in terms of uh, law. Uh, <laughs> but I think in terms of aphorisms, yeah. uh, he was nobody better. nobody better. Yeah. Uh, justice Brandeis was. Yes. A quite wonderful writer, I think, and a quite wonderful justice as well. Um, you know, and Justice Marshall, or Chief Justice Marshall, uh -huh. you know, has so many, you know, phrases for the ages. Yeah. Uh, so I think those are the ones that I would think about. Right, but uh, you couldn't, most. like, really try to imitate any of these people. No, I mean, I think... I mean, some of them are too long ago, and they, they write in ways that are not very 2019, you know? No, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I think you have to come up with your own voice and times change, uh, but I think there's, you couldn't write like Justice Jackson. I mean, one couldn't write today like Justice Jackson, and I think it just would be inauthentic. Yes. Uh, if you said that. Right, people would say, what, 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 is she, what is she doing? <laughs> 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 Who talks like that anymore, you know? <laughs> now, so one other topic on leadership, and then we're gonna open it up for questions in a, in a, a couple minutes. Um, so talking about leadership, um, we actually, Professor Hillary Sale teaches a wonderful course on women and leadership. Uh, you know, you've been both a leader of a law school and uh, a leader on the court. What is, what's your model of leadership and is it different being the dean of a law school and being on the court? Uh, yes, because I don't really lead anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, uh, when you're a dean of law school, you know, I know you are the, the leader of law school. It's not like you can do anything you want, mm -hmm. but, um, but you are the leader of the law school. The chief justice is very clear that the associate justices are not leaders of the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you, know, we, you know, we are nine sort of equal participants, mm -hmm. and to the extent that we're unequal, the chief justice is the unequal one. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I don't think that the same kinds of things that I thought about all the time, I guess with one exception, which I'll, I'll uh, uh, but you know, I thought all the time, uh, you're a dean of a law school, basically your whole job is to try to figure out how to lead an institution and to learn how to do that. And most of the skills that I picked up doing that, uh, I think are pretty much irrelevant um, uh, when it comes to, you know, being one of nine people around a table voting and uh, trying to persuade other people mm -hmm. about how a case should come out. Um, uh, you know, notwithstanding how much deans say that they listen or that they confer with their faculty, you know, in the end, it's still sort of your job to run the thing. And that's not my job mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I will say that one of the things that you learn as a dean uh, is, you know, effective leadership is awfully hard without good listening. Uh, I mean, listening is not alone enough mm -hmm. to make somebody into a, 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 a great leader of a law school or of an, any kind of organization, but, but I think it's a kind of sine qua non. And, um, and effective leadership is also, uh, excuse me, and, and, um, and, and that kind of uh, listening ability is I think also critical to what I do now. Mm -hmm. I mean, because as we sit there and we talk about these cases and we try to persuade each other, I think um, effective persuasion only happens when you understand where another person is coming from and what might uh, speak to his or her concerns. So I guess if there's anything that, um, that, is, imp that is important in both sorts of roles and that I think Okay, to the extent that I learned something as a dean, it was to be a good, les uh, be a good listener. Um, that, that's really important on the court, too. Now, and when you were clerking, uh, were there leaders on the court who you've learned from in terms of, of model? When I was clerking... So, in other words, like Justice Marshall yeah. and Justice Brennan. Uh, you know, did you learn anything from them in terms of, you know, your role now in terms of kind of building majorities? Ah, um, uh, well, they were not building all that many majorities the year I was there. Uh, and I think, you know, J Justice Marshall was never really in a position where he could play that role. Justice Brennan, for some number of years on the court, uh, was in that position. And, and of course, you know, many people think of Justice Brennan, you know, he used to say, you, 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 you know, the most important thing for a justice was to be able to count to five. And, and some people think that he had a kind of miraculous ability to create those uh, alliances of five. And there are other people who think, well, it helps when you have seven to start with. Um, you know, that, uh, yeah. uh, that the years in which he was playing that role were years in which he had a kind of natural um, Mm -hmm. uh, coalition, if, if, if you will. But, um, but, you know, honestly, I think the way the institution works, at least now, whether it worked this way in Justice Brennan's time, I don't really know. But the way the institution works now is that these are um, nine exceptionally smart, uh, diligent people, all of whom uh, have their own ideas about uh, how law should be done, all of them uh, operating in complete good faith, uh, but not necessarily on the same track. And, uh, and it's hard to convince people. And, um, and you can only do it on the merits, and you can only do it by listening hard to why they think something different from what you would like them to think. And, uh, you know, and, and that's what I try to do, that's what others try to do, is to, is, is, is to listen and to be in a position to persuade. So actually, so we have, if people want to ask questions, we have two microphones. Um, so please stand by the microphone. So there and there. Um, while people are stepping down. Um, is it different for the court now that other than you, they're all former appellate judges? Does that make a difference in terms of You know, I don't know. I don't really have anything to compare it to. I know that there are, you know, some people who think that the court 
uh, you, you go back to some some courts, you know, I think like the Brown v. Board Court had no appellate ju mm -hmm. judges, right? Um, mostly politicians. And some people think uh, so, uh, maybe some real world experience is, um, uh, is, is lacking on a, on a court like ours where almost everybody has been an appellate judge. And frankly, I come from a world which was not very different from that. You know, it's a world of law schools and, uh, uh, you know, but, but there aren't any politicians, any, any, uh, any, anybody who just brings a completely different set of experiences to bear. I don't know, um, you know, I, I guess I'm not altogether a fan of that model. I think that most of what we do is pretty serious lawyers work. Mm -hmm. I can't think that most, uh, most people who haven't done pretty serious lawyering in their lives would find most of it very interesting. Uh, or uh, that, I think, I mean, I think, you know, uh, so I, I guess I, I, don't, I don't mind that, you know, I, I don't really, um, uh, you know, see the alternative as a better one. Good. All right. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Why don't we start uh, to the left and stay your name and then ask the question. Got it. Um, so first, I'd like to say thank you, Justice Kagan and Dean Treanor, for coming. Uh, my name is Arian. I'm a freshman at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. And I just wanted to ask, uh, just, uh, Justice Kagan, I remember when you were discussing Justice Scalia that at some point in the past, you had also mentioned that Justice Scalia helped influence your statutorial interpretation process. I may be mistaken in this, but if you could discuss that a little bit more, how does that manifest in how you look at statute more generally? Yeah, I don't know um, uh, if, if he influenced it on the court. I think, um, you know, Justice Scalia was, was, had just become a justice uh, when I went to law school. And, and, and for sure, his ideas about statutory interpretation were ideas that I, as a, as a, law, as a law student and then as a clerk and the, as a young lawyer, you had to sort of think about uh, quite a lot. And, uh, you know, along with other ideas that were uh, the exact opposite of them. I mean, I do put myself in a camp of, uh, you know, that I am more textualist than um, s some of my colleagues are. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that I am uh, down the line with Justice Scalia and his views on statutory interpretation. We think different things about when to use legislative history. Um, he thought, never. <laughs> I, I think it is sometimes appropriate, but 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 um, but often not. Um, so you know, I think there are, there are ways in which we uh, vary, as you can see, because sometimes we disagreed on uh, statutory interpretation cases. Sometimes using the same method, we just reached a different result, and sometimes our methodological differences might have accounted for that. But for the most part, I do think of myself as a person who puts text first and pays a lot of attention to text and uh, cannot uh, really imagine, except in highly unusual cases, um, doing something that I think the plain text uh, precludes. You know, that, uh, uh, you know, if you read a statute and it says what it says, that's where you stop. Would you consider a lawmaker's intent? I don't think you get a follow-up. I don't get it. It's all right. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> On the right. Hello. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Evan. I don't want to fall down the stairs here. Um, my name is Evan. I'm a rising 2L at GW Law. And uh, going back to the discussion. You're in the wrong building. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Georgetown undergrad alum, so I didn't ah, immediately okay. burst into flames when I walked in the door. But um, so going back to the discussion of your writing style, I, it made me think of a case from a few years ago involving a Spider-Man toy. Yeah. Where you made several references to Spider-Man comic books, which as a nerd, I really appreciated. <laughs> Um, so part of me wants to ask you who your favorite Spider-Man is, but more seriously, I also want to ask you whether you see that as part of a way to kind of reach people yeah. and sort of meet them where they are. And obviously you need to judiciously uh, 
deploy those kind of pop culture references. Um, but I'm curious sort of what you think, how useful you think that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny because the case that uh, you mentioned is a case that I mentioned because I was talking before about stare decisis, and it's a case about stare decisis, and it's the one that I told you um, uh, I wrote the majority opinion on about this patent uh, decision. And it was uh, the facts of the case. It's not like I just started talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So, I mean, you know, I, I read Spider-Man as a kid. My, my brother was a big comic book aficionado, and so you had to, like, know a little bit about what he thought. Uh, but the case was about a Spider-Man, it was like, uh, we, we actually had one in my <laughs> office. You, you sort of put it over your hand and then you went like this and webs came out, you know, everywhere, right? And it was like, who had a patent on this invention was <laughs> what the case was about. So when you come to writing an opinion like that, well, that is low hanging fruit, I have to say. <laughs> I was like, if you can't get a Spider-Man reference into a, dis a case like that, you're not working hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was fun. I ended, I, uh, that was, it was a, I, I, I had a fun time writing it. Um, not just because of the substance, which I think is important, but, um, but because, you know, who, who can't have a good time writing about, like, Spider-Man gloves? <laughs> Where, uh, and, and at the end, I think was the last paragraph of the opinion, you talked about the last paragraph of my Nick opinion, but the last paragraph of the opinion where, 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 uh, where I, I was talking about, I don't even remember how it was related to the uh, substance of the decision, but what, what was it? It was, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Is that the idea? But, yeah. It's sort of like we have the power to overrule cases, but we have the responsibility to use that power. <laughs> not, not often, you know? So that seems appropriate. That's right. Yeah. So which was your favorite Spider-Man movie? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this because I was just on a plane. I was coming back from uh, London, and I just I, I watched uh, the Spider Verse, you know, movie, whatever that's called. I thought that was pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's now five o'clock, and I don't have great power, but I do have great responsibility. <laughs> so uh, what an extraordinary hour! So thank you so much to Justice thank Kagan. You. Thank you, Dean Trainer and Justice Kagan, for such a fascinating and thought-provoking conversation. I would also like to thank the staff and board of Washington Council of Lawyers for all their hard work in making today's event possible. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you're not a member, please do join us. And we invite everyone to join us for a, a, a reception at the top of the stairs in the lobby of the Hart Auditorium. So thank you so much. That was fun. Thank you so much. That was great. <laughs>